And welcome to Divorce Hacker. I'm your host, Dan Grant. On this show, we'll have a variety of guests who've been through divorce and are experts on the topic. Whether you're thinking about a divorce, in the midst of it, or already divorced, we are here to share our stories with you in the hope that you may relate, learn, process, and overcome whatever you're experiencing in your life. Kevin Bergen completely changed his career in 1998 because he wanted to make a difference in people's lives. He left the corporate world to become a marriage and family therapist and especially enjoys relationship coaching and recovery work. He's our guest today on Divorce Hacker because we want to learn how to make our relationships better and avoid the pitfalls that can land people in my office. Kevin, in my work as a divorce lawyer, one of the primary complaints I hear is that communication is broken down with the other partner. What are some of the tools that couples can use to foster effective communication and take the emotion out of difficult conversations? That's a really good point. I have this model that I've put together called the communication formula. And one of the most important parts of that is looking at the formula as a, like a frame. And so when the, the winds and the, the storms of emotion that want to blow us off the scaffolding, the structure, um, emotion does that. Emotion sidetracks us. Emotion gets in the way of what we're really trying to cover. And so with the formula, they can hold on to it because that's not going anywhere. And it's being able to get to the root of communication so that the emotion doesn't get us off track. And so this, this formula is, it's really simple, actually. It's all about being able to see there's a sender and there's a receiver. What's the sender's job? What's the receiver's job? And the whole thing is, if you as a receiver can let somebody feel understood, feel heard, there's 90% of the problem there that, that that's, that's fixes this problem because it's really great to be agreed with, but what we really all want at the core and many of us aren't even aware of it, but what we want is just to feel heard. A lot of times I'll see couples and even individuals finally get this part of it or their partner says something like, I'm so glad you explained it that way. I never got that before. Now it makes sense to me. And then the other person is like, finally, somebody's listening to me because it's kind of rare that we feel heard and listened to. It's a really good point. So let's do a little play acting. Sure. All right. Um, And then you can tell me how I'm doing. Sure. So let's pretend that we're a couple Mm -hmm. and we're talking about something that couples, as you and I both know, can be um, problematic finances. Oh, yeah. So I'm going to set up a hypothetical. Let's say that you just went out and bought yourself a new Harley, Mm -hmm. but you didn't tell me. And we have tuition coming due uh, for one of our children who is going to be starting college. Mm -hmm. And I just, you just drove up on your Harley. You were really excited. You know, the engine's roaring. And I became very upset. And this landed us in your office as a couples therapist. Okay. Okay. So, so let's play act... Mm-hmm. Now, the Maybe. important part here is establishing 
who is the sender, who is the receiver, okay. who needs to feel understood. I'm guessing that's going to be you because you're complaining about my frivolous spending. Is I came right? into your office and I was just furious that you bought a Harley mm -hmm. as opposed to putting um, your bonus into a savings account mm -hmm. for our first child that's headed off to college. Mm -hmm. And I'm so upset that, you know, it's causing me to question whether I can trust you, my yeah. spouse, um, or even stay married to him. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. and, and we got into a terrible fight. Yep. He shut down and I just kept screaming at him. Damn. So what, how would you handle that? So even doing this play acting, it accentuates the, the tendency that we all have to get defensive. Right. This isn't even a real situation. And yet I'm thinking, well, I deserve that Harley. I've saved up a lot. I work hard. I, it's my bonus. Right. I can do what I want. But that's about me. When you're the receiver in a conversation, in communication, your job is to keep everything about the sender. Mm. If you do that, you're going to help open up the receiver so that the receiver relaxes and then can hear you. But the hardest job in the communication formula is the receiver's job because that's all about keeping it all about the sender so that the sender feels understood. So in this scenario, this hypothetical, yes. the sender is the wife who's angry. Good, yes. And so would you be counseling the husband to hear what she has to say, which is, I'm going to be here for a minute. Look, sure. I'm just really upset because I know you think this is your bonus that you earned, but it's our daughter that's going to college. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how we're going to be able to pay for her and our three other kids who are like lined up to go to college. If you're going to be spending our money on frivolous things, you're Harley. Like we got to send these kids to college and be, I'm, I'm just really scared about this. And so he responds ideally this way. Babe, thanks for explaining that to me. I clearly wasn't looking at it from that perspective. And it is really important that our kids have means to be able to go to college. That's just as important to me as it is to you. And I really see how important it is to you. And so I can see how upsetting it would be to see me drive up. So are what, you going to sell the Harley? Like, what are you going to do? That sounds like something that would solve the problem for you right now. Is is that it? Does, does that feel like that would solve this issue? Well, I don't know. I feel like we just need to like talk about our finances more. I mean, I don't, I don't really know. Like you just took your bonus and spent it on yourself. Like, I don't really know where the money's going. And you keep telling me it's going to be fine, but I need more transparency. Okay, so you're you're feeling confused. You say, I don't know. What an awful position to be in. Okay, so cut this. What What's that happening? Did, that actually made me feel calmer, even though we're not a couple and this hasn't happened. Can you identify I, why you felt calmer? Yeah, I felt, like you said, I felt heard. And... Yeah. I didn't feel like you were usually, okay, I'm still play acting. You always just shut down and don't talk to me. Then you get the silent treatment. Like you, you heard me and I felt scared. And when you heard me, it allowed me to ascertain what I'm actually scared about. And yes. it's really not about the Harley because, you know, if we can afford it, I want you to have all the things, material things you want. But I need more transparency because I don't know where the money's going. Mm -hmm. So I feel very frightened because I don't know. Mm -hmm. So now I feel like we're a team. Right. And this is this is a really good point. We feel like a team because a couple 
needs to work shoulder to shoulder on a problem in front of them as opposed to face to face the other being the problem. Oh, I love that. Say that again. If we can work together shoulder to shoulder, then we're a team. Mm. That's what I've all so we don't have to I'm fight each together. other. That's what I've always wanted. And I just That's haven't right. felt that since for years. Right. Because we've been off you're at work and I'm taking care of the house. I, like I haven't felt that till now. Because I have been so self-focused. And that's not working in a relationship. We can't, neither one of us can be completely self-focused and expect a relationship to work. That's awesome. That was great. Thank you for doing that with me. So sometimes one of the partners in a relationship will yeah. engage in passive aggressive behavior or communication mm. that can degrade the relationship over time. And I think we just saw that a little mm -hmm. bit in our own play acting. But is there, a, in addition to what we just talked about, a mm -hmm. solution for this? Like one of the things I've heard recently on another podcast mm. that I listened to was for women in particular, mm -hmm. the magic combination for communication is to be assertive and warm mm -hmm. as opposed to aggressive, which is sometimes seen as being shrill or bitchy. Oh yeah. So, so I really took note of that as a mm -hmm. professional woman, assertive and warm, because those two skill sets don't always come hand in hand. But I, do you have any tools that couples could use or individuals could use to improve mm -hmm. um, how they kind of shift their communication styles so it's more effective? I used to describe this aggressive on one end and passive on the other end as this continuum. And it, it called for some kind of a meeting in the middle, a balance, which I called assertive. But that didn't work so well because the aggressive narcissist husband didn't want to go toward the middle because it looked too much like going toward the passive end. And it's like, I'm never going to be passive. That's it. And the same thing held true for those on the passive side. He or she would feel like, oh no, it's just going to be a big problem and it's going to be an argument. I don't want to go toward assertive because that's not me. I never am going to be aggressive. And so I devised what I've come to call the interaction dial. Now it's not a straight line. Now it's a circle. If you can imagine uh, a compass with north and south and east and west on the sides, I put assertives in the north. Do you have a, do you have your dial? I do. You want to show it to us? I do. Okay. It might be easier for us to see. I don't know it. which uh, camera is going to want to look at this the best. I'll, I'll, I'll go with this one. Uh, and so if north up here is assertive, then it leaves passive over here in the east and aggressive over here in the west. And then passive aggressive down here mm. when it was a straight line there was no place for passive aggressive right i see that and it's an insidious problem that so many people don't understand i hear people using the word passive aggressive quite often and i'm thinking they don't really understand what that means and, well, and I see it in my office a lot oh, when okay. um, a client will come in. Mm -hmm. So the way it often shows up is sort of back to what you originally described, mm -hmm. where you may have a very successful um, husband, for example. Yeah. And so he's effective in his work. Mm -hmm. He may have his own company or maybe he doesn't, but mm -hmm. often he will. And so he's quite aggressive in the workplace. He brings that home, and sometimes in these situations, there's a counterbalance in the other partner where, like you pointed out, it's they I, they find over time, I think, that it's easier just to retreat within mm -hmm. than to be 
confrontational and assert their needs. And so there becomes a tremendous power imbalance. And then what I see is often when the youngest child leaves for college, the partner, often the wife, who's the more passive person, Mm -hmm. she's just at the breaking point and will come in and just say, I'm not doing this anymore. Mm -hmm. So I think that your approach could be really effective in helping couples Mm -hmm. overcome this. So how do you use this in your practice to coach people? Okay, so let's say she's the client. Okay. And her husband's the one who's exhibiting all this passive aggressive behavior. The answer is she wants to identify where she is on the dial. And the answer is always go north. Oh, I love that. This makes always it so go easy to up. understand. Regardless of where you are, if you're in the passive side, you want to go up toward assertive. Assertive. If you're down here, a little passive aggressive, but on the aggressive side, you want to go up. You want to go toward assertive. What's the difference between, can you give examples of the difference between being aggressive and assertive? Let's go back to our hypothetical. Mm -hmm. And you're the husband. You're coaching this couple. (laughs) How would you tell him to be in addition to the coaching tips that we went through earlier? Let's give him a name. What's his name? Uh, Let's call him Mark. Mark, we've established what's going on for you and your wife. And what's going to help her is going to help you too. The same thing. This dial applies for both of you. And we've established that she kind of hovers over here in Passiveville. Right. Like I'm Mark now. I had no idea that she Mm. felt the way she did about our finances. She never told me. Right. I didn't know. So when I got my bonus, I just like figured it was fine if I went and got a Harley. I was willing to take her for a ride on the back. And how were you supposed to do anything that you don't know about? Right. So if she's hovering over here and you're hovering over here and you didn't know that for a long time... And I'm going to guess, Mark, that there's a significant part of you right now that still doesn't believe that you hover around passive aggressive. Maybe you flip back and forth between passive and aggressive on the sides. It doesn't matter because the answer is always go north. How is this going to benefit you? Okay, your wife is just agreeing. She's not really letting you know where she's at, and she's always trying to calm the waves. You don't have much to work with. And so if we have each of you trying to go north, that means you're going to find some relief from where you're at and she's going to find relief from where she's at. Let's go back and just redefine some of these terms. Very simply, passive is lose-win. The passive person is always looking for ways to benefit the other the partner, and they end up losing. Right. So she's always looking out for him, and she's always on the the wanting side. Right. She doesn't get her needs met. That's right. Aggressive is win-lose. He's always looking out for his best interest. Who cares about anybody else? That's right. So it's win-lose. Passive aggressive is just lose lose. Right. We'll go into that some more, but that's just lose lose. The reason assertive is win win is because, from her perspective, she's saying, okay, how do I look out for myself a little bit more? 
and that's going to pull her up to the top in assertive. He's saying, how do I look out for her a little bit more? And that's pulling him up to assertive because this is the balance. This is win-win. I win, she wins, everybody wins. If it's not equally beneficial, then your approach was not assertive. I like this. This is really helpful. I like your dial. Thank you. Yeah, it's great. It's a good tool. Just last week, I had a client tell me, this has been so helpful to me, not just with my wife, but in my business. He has a pretty big business and he works with a lot of people. And he says, you know what? This works at work too. That's right. And I was like, yeah, I did know that. <laughs> yeah. These communication tools are yes. effective in a relationship, but we are all dealing with relationships all day. And so. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's why I say when somebody's getting a divorce, it's just as important, sometimes maybe more important, that they learn how to communicate with each other. If there's kids, they're going to be in each other's lives always. And even if there's not, getting through the divorce amicably in a healthy, effective way is simply more pleasant than fighting. Oh, it's a game changer. Right? Yeah, life's too short. And if they understand the communication formula and the interaction dial, they can self-check. And that anytime this, this sense of, oh, but she's, it's a self-check. Oh yeah, but she is whatever that objection is and not, but, and I can make these adjustments so that this interaction is more pleasant for me. Right. And the collateral damage to the children is minimized. Yes. Game changer. It's a total game changer. So important. Yeah. Yeah. Let me ask you a question about a situation that I do see landing many people in my office. I often will hear with couples, particularly at this inflection point where the youngest child goes off to college and everybody's living so much longer. I think, you know, if it's not a thriving relationship, oftentimes, um, especially, well, women and men, men sometimes are more conflict averse. So often it's the women that will come into my office and say, I've had it, I'm done. Mm. And what the report is that they're like roommates. Mm -hmm. That there's no intimacy, mm. that over the course of time, it's as though be, they became business partners in their marriage, mm. uh, managing, getting, you know, when children are younger, um, you know, if they have more than one kid or even one kid, just getting them to their sporting events and their mm. commitments, managing the, the finances of the marital estate, yeah. um, but the joy is gone. And so, um, you know, it's become very transactional. Mm -hmm. And I know this is something that we've talked about that you also are dealing with in your practice. Mm -hmm. So what are the red flags mm -hmm. and how do you avoid that? Because there are so many constraints put upon couples with respect to um, demands of mm -hmm. job, family, and so on. Like, how do you avoid not going into we're just roommates and yeah. engaging in the transaction of running the marital estate mm -hmm. and now our last kid is left and we're going to live much longer than people used to and so we don't want to be together anymore yeah the key word i heard here is roommates right i hear this quite often and it seems like a, a dawning understanding for either one of them or both of them that, oh, we're just like roommates and I don't like this. And when I first got this concept and explained it to a client, she was relieved 
and devastated because what I told her was, you don't have a relationship. Right. And she was like, well, I know that's what I just told you. And I said, no, this is terminology. You have a marriage, but it's not a relationship. And the question becomes, well, if I don't have a relationship, what is it? And I said, it's just an arrangement. Yes. It's just an arrangement. And that is true for almost every single person that ends in my up in my office. Mm. Pretty much across the board, that can be said. And so it's really important for us to talk about this. Right. Relationship versus arrangement is talking about the state of things. What do you have? What are you working with? The other part is how you interact in that state, whatever it is. If you do what most of us do in life, what comes naturally, and you transact with members of your family, we're talking about couples here, if you transact primarily with your partner, you're going to have problems. It's going to become an arrangement. So what's the answer? It's the more complex, the more difficult, and the thing that mom and dad never taught us. My third grade teacher didn't teach us. The Sunday school teacher didn't teach me. That's where this should come from. But if we think we're going to have a happy relationship, we must relate and not just transact. We always have to transact to some degree, but unless we relate more than we transact, we're going to have problems. So how do you do that in the so day to day? What does relate when mean? You, get, you know, mom's getting up and making breakfast. Yeah. Mom and dad are then mom's or dad is taking the kids to daycare. Both the parents then start their job either remotely or, right. I mean, a lot of it is remote. They're working all day. Now it's time. Mm -hmm. Go get the kids. Mm -hmm. Now we got to take him to soccer. Mm. There's two kids. I'll take her to her dance lesson. Will you take him to soccer? Mm -hmm. Now we're back. We're making dinner. Okay, dinner is done. Now I've got to check email while you read the kids' stories. Right. Okay, now it's 930 at night. I just want to go watch Netflix and have a glass of wine. I don't want to relate. Mm -hmm. I want to be like left alone for a minute mm -hmm. so I can go to sleep and wake up and do this again. Right. How do we relate in that scenario that plays out over 18 years where at the end of it, I just say, I'm, I don't relate. I'm bye. What, what do we do in the day to day? If a transactional approach is to accomplish something, a relational approach is to hold concern for your partner. If I'm holding concern, if I'm thinking that my wife has had a hard day, I'm naturally going to look for, how can I support her? Mm -hmm. If I'm relating to my partner, even if she's not present, I'm thinking about her. I just care about her. Mm -hmm. And if I'm relating, it's going to come across in how... I communicate with her in the actions that I take, in the way I live my life, mm -hmm. because I'm becoming other focused. Yes, that's a key. That is super key because I can be totally self focused. And the more I do that, the more likely it is that I'm going to be alone. Right. So nobody's going to want to be around me. Right. But if I focus on relating with my partner and my kids in my family, even with extended family and good friends, mm -hmm. this is what I call loved ones, mm -hmm. is partner, children, extended family, and good friends. 
if we transact with them more than we relate with them, it's going to become meaningless. That's right. And I see more estrangement between people in families, couples, friends, because it became an arrangement. Yeah. Yes. I'm friends with someone because I just enjoy being around them. But I transact with people because I want to get something out of that interaction. Right. And so if I, if I focus on this element of what does it mean to relate? What does it mean to have relational interaction? It's other focused. It's being able to just spend time because I like to be with that person. Right. I've seen clients come in before where he's just clueless and she's complaining that, you know, you're never home. And when you are, you're always working on something and you're doing this and you're doing that. And she says, just come in here in the living room and let's just be together. And he has this total blank look on his face and he's like, why? <laughs> Why would I do that? Right, right. Why do you even want to do that? And Because he doesn't get the idea of, I care about this person and I just enjoy being with her. Yeah. That's what's missing for him, but she gets it. Right. And it's, it's unfortunately, it's a, often a male female thing. Yeah. Because men naturally transact and women more naturally relate. And it's like oil and vinegar sometime, mm -hmm. unless they enjoy being with each other enough that they want to learn from each other and he can start to get it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so it, it's this whole element of be more relational. You have to be transactional. So you maybe don't reduce the transactional interactions. You just increase the relational. So would that look like in the scenario I laid out where they're just kind of getting through the week? Yeah. Um, spending more time together, maybe on the weekends or taking trips together and getting away from the routine. Even at breakfast time, before everybody's getting ready to run out of the house, I can do that relationally too. Mm -hmm. I've got this meeting today. I've got to make sure I remember to take these files with me. I've got, I'm thinking of all, I'm thinking of me. Yep. I can do that and... Hey, how'd you sleep last night? Yeah. Did you get that homework done last night? It, I know you were really struggling with it. Was the help I offered okay? Uh, Do you hear how that's more relational sure. than transactional? Yep. But the same thing's going on. A lot of things we, we, we have to transact. People can't always see from the outside, whether we're doing this relationally or transactionally, but the difference is our intention, what's going on inside of us. What and am our, I thinking our about? Our words, how we convey it. It translates into words. That's how the other party senses that, oh, this is nice, as opposed to, ooh, just kind of cringing. Mm-hmm, mm -hmm. For a parent to say, did you get your homework done? The kid's going to cringe because it's very transactional. They have to perform. Right, right, right. But for a parent to say, did you get your homework done? It's because the parent cares about the kid and the kid feels that. Right, right. That's going to keep this family from being an arrangement 
and more of a family relationship. So let's talk for a moment about intimacy. How do you help couples when their needs in this regard aren't being met? For example, the wife feels like she's not receiving emotional support mm -hmm. and the husband feels like his physical needs aren't being met. And over time, mm -hmm. this leads to disconnection, which grows mm -hmm. and often lands people in my office. Let's unpack that because I mm -hmm. think it's connected to what we just talked about, mm -hmm. but it can show up then physically and emotionally in ways that can lead them to finally get divorced when maybe if they could nip it in the bud mm -hmm. and apply some of these tools, it could be avoided. Exactly. I discuss intimacy as intimacy with a capital I. Okay. Because everybody has their own idea of what intimacy is. So I like to define it. Mm -hmm. And by defining it, then we're all working with the same terms because he, referring to the typical husband, hears the word intimacy and he thinks of sex. Right. She may think of sex when she hears the word intimacy, but she's just as likely to think of sitting together on the veranda or going for a walk on the beach together and talking about their hopes and dreams. Exactly. Right? Yes. So intimacy, capital I, is classified as two parts. If all of this is intimacy, then just about 10 to 20% of it is physical intimacy. And... Here's my definition of intimacy that applies, I believe, to all intimacy. One partner opens up and shares an important part of the self. The other partner receives that, supports it, and accepts it. Doesn't necessarily have to embrace and agree but they understand it. That goes back to the communication formula. They receive it and they, they support it. When that happens, intimacy has occurred. And it requires a vulnerability in order to show that piece of yourself. That's the test to know if you're going to have intimacy or you have had intimacy because the person sharing, opening up must feel vulnerable, mm -hmm. must be risking something. And safe, it feels safe enough to do that. Exactly. Well, they don't even know yet if it's safe enough. Mm. They're taking a risk. Right. That it, they're hoping it'll be safe enough. Yeah. That's a, a good test. If there's no risk or vulnerability, sorry, dude, you're not going to have intimacy. Right. Because there's nothing at stake. Right. And it's when you really risk that she could get mad at me. She could pity me. She could point and laugh. Hmm. She could turn away. She could reject him. Mm. She could abandon him. Right. And when she doesn't, when she moves closer and receives him, mm -hmm. it might be the first time this has ever happened for him in his whole life. And that's how trust is built. That's how trust is built. Mm -hmm. In increments. Yep. You don't start with the biggest risk right. you start with a smaller risk right because every interaction we have with people is some degree of intimacy even at the grocery store going through the checkout line the the cashier i have some level of intimacy so you might ask well what's the risk there well, if I walk up 
and I look at her and smile, I'm risking that she could scowl at me. <laughs> now, that's a minute risk, but it's a risk nonetheless. This is just a lower degree of intimacy between two people. Mm -hmm. We have different degrees of intimacy with different people, mm -hmm. and we have different types of intimacy with different people. I have a different type of intimacy with my wife than I do with my daughter. Of course. Than I do with a coworker, than I do with the mailman. Right. It's a different type and certainly different degree. And so it becomes really important to keep going back to that basic definition of intimacy, opening up risking something and it's an informed risk. I'm not going to walk up to a guy on the street that looks like he may not be safe to open up my wallet and say, Hey, do you know where this location is that I have on a map in my wallet? And I've got all these bills hanging out of it. That's just dumb. Why would I risk that? So it has to be informed risk. Right. We start with very small risks, even with our partner. We start with small risks, and then we get more and more as each one of those risks is rewarded with intimacy. And so do you suggest to counter this syndrome that you and I are both seeing where we talked about it earlier, or we're just roommates, there's no connection, there's no intimacy, either physically, you know, or this, the scenario we're talking about now, which is, um, wife is like, I feel like there's no emotional connection mm -hmm. and separately husbands telling you or, or me, um, we haven't had sex in years. Mm -hmm. Like she withholds physical um, sex for me, like, yeah. you know, and we're now in the standoff and there's nothing left. So, so if we, if we reverse engineer this, mm. are you suggesting then over the lifetime of a couple, which could be hopefully many, many decades, mm. they're always continuing to sort of like a rubber band experience, like this give and take of vulnerability and trust and and intimacy so they can weather life storms and enjoy the things that are joyful in life? Is, is that what you're, where you're headed yes, with this? because they always have to risk. Mm. Otherwise, they can't feel intimate with their partner. And they don't feel like they're handling things shoulder to shoulder like we start right. a session with. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. I think of that scene in the movie Inception. Yeah. When they're the the couple is together and they get older and older and older and older, and there's a shot where they're just sitting together as two old people. And I'm thinking they still relate to each other mm -hmm. because they practice intimacy. They, they practice open up. that's yes. the, they practice. Yes. It's intentional. It doesn't happen. We have to make it happen. Yeah. It's a practice. It develops. It grows. And if it doesn't develop and grow, it dies. That's right. It will not stay static. Right. So you have to work at it. Absolutely. So let me ask you another question. Um, I know that you specialize in helping men overcome sex addiction. Mm -hmm. And this is also landing a lot of women in my office who are in marriages where they've learned um, that their husbands are hooked on pornography. And of course, that erodes the type of intimacy, um, both kinds that we've been talking about. Yeah. So talk to me about this issue, which I think is becoming even more exacerbated with young men with the access to the internet mm -hmm. and really wreaking havoc in their ability to have intimate, loving relationships. Like right. how do you address this with men and with women? 
sex addiction is not a problem with sex. It's a problem with intimacy. Yes. Men or women with sex addiction had some problem with intimacy growing up. They never learned. And in their minds, they equate sex with intimacy. Mm -hmm. They equate sex with belonging. They equate sex with being loved. Uh, they equate sex with showing love. Sex becomes paramount. And you mention younger people. I'm so scared for youth because it's just becoming like past the salt to get naked and have intercourse. Mm -hmm. If I don't care if you're just meeting someone, if you've been together for a while, or if you've been married decades, if you don't keep your emotional intimacy more developed than your physical intimacy, there's going to be problems. Mm. Because physical intimacy lends itself more to a transaction. And emotional intimacy is more of relating to each other. Mm -hmm. And so I had one client years ago who was divorced. He had been divorced for oh, at least 15 years. And he would meet women and fall madly in love with them. Or so he thought it was love. But he would just pour himself into the relationship completely. And then find out she was just having fun. And he would get devastated. Hmm. And that's when I first realized that he was jumping all the way into physical intimacy almost immediately. And there was no emotional intimacy. And so when she would take off, he would feel used. He would feel abandoned. He would have all of these old experiences come back for him. And he just didn't know how to deal with it. And one of the, the biggest milestones or, or points of doing something different for him was hold off on the physical intimacy until we can develop more emotional intimacy. They were going to break up much sooner before he got so sucked in or they were going to have some really beautiful relating going on. And then the sex became a complement to that. Right. It's sort of an old fashioned approach, but there's a method to the madness. <laughs> Whether it's old fashioned or not, let's just take the morality off it completely. Yeah. It's just psychological. It works. And emotional. It works. Right. That's what we're interested in. I what heard works. recently something that just really stopped me in my tracks. I went, wait, this really matches with my intimacy theory and the interaction dial and the community, all this stuff. It was said, sex does a great job. Well, let's reverse it. Um, Transacting does a really good job of creating a uh, emotional sense. So that's when we, we do things um, not transactionally, but relationally. We, we tend to be able to get this um, feeling going on there, and it creates intimacy but sex is 
more effectively used by reflecting that intimacy rather than creating it. Right, 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 right. So if there's a bond between two people, uh, sex can only reflect that bond, not create the bond. Right. That makes sense. I get right. it. Yeah. And, and, and now many people have flipped the script. Exactly. And that's why we have a lot of problems. Well, yeah. We have a lot of people that <clears throat> never had a father. We have a lot of people whose parents, either one of them or both, have had emotional illness that didn't teach the kid any of this stuff about how to interact with other humans. Right. This, I don't know why this stuff isn't taught in elementary school. Yeah. And instead we have young people now just watching porn and thinking yes. that that's how a relationship is supposed to be, which is just not accurate. There is no better example of fraud than pornography. It bills itself as intimacy, mm -hmm. but there is no intimacy there. There's nobody to have intimacy with. Right. It's a performance. Yes. Yes. So I represent many women who are divorcing narcissistic men, and I know that you come across this in your practice. Yeah. Um, in your experience, how do you suggest women in this situation break free? Mm. and interact with a narcissist or not interact and set boundaries so mm. they can move forward. That's a good distinction right there. Uh, first, accept that you're not going to change the narcissist. Mm. Right. And from a bigger perspective, you're not going to change another person, period. Right. You can't change your partner. You can't change your mother. You can't change your your uh, employee, you just can't change people. Once we accept that and stop trying, everything gets a little looser and a lot easier. And then it becomes, but I can change me. It's true. And so if you're dealing with narcissism, I can't change this person. But what I can change are the boundaries that I set the boundaries that I keep and I can work to become more assertive than passive or than passive aggressive. And the more I work on me to become the person I want to be, it doesn't matter what the other person is. Right. And some people, well, that's very self-focused. No, I don't think it is. We can be completely self-focused in life, or we can be more other-focused. We can't be completely other-focused because we still have to take care of ourselves. Yeah. And that's why I used to say, well, you have to be self-focused to some degree. I don't think that anymore. I think when you're other focused, you still have to practice self-care. Right. Self-care is very different from self-focused approach. Self-care means I'm going to benefit people around me every bit as much as I'm benefiting myself. That's why it's still part of other focus. And so... If I'm the passive partner to a narcissistic partner, I'm saying, I'm just going to be more assertive. I'm going to be healthier. I'm going to be calmer when I talk to my narcissistic partner. She might be ranting and raving at me, not caring about how I feel or about how my needs are getting met and I can just understand well, that's where my partner is. 
I'm going to say this to you, honey, and look out for you a little bit more than I was before. And I'm going to look out for me a lot more than I was before. So those things can start to equal. And I'm just going to be happier. It might be attractive to you when I act that way. That'll be icing on the cake if our relationship improves. But the bottom line is, I'm going to be assertive because that's going to make me happier and most of the people around me. So this is a nice segue into the book that you've written, The Bergen Protocol, How to Achieve Your Goals. And I actually recently read your book and I've implemented your protocol, which is really a way to jumpstart your well-being and self-care. Can you explain the protocol? Because I am already finding that it's increased my satisfaction and happiness and mm-hmm. serenity in my day to day. So I'm I'm a big, awesome to I'm hear. A, I'm a big fan. And I'll let your listeners know that you are being sincere. This isn't just a line for your show here. You actually have read this book and you have been or you told me that before we started recording that this is actually something that you've implemented. The protocol in simple terms is looking at the things that you want to accomplish, things that are going to make you a better person, the person that you want to be, and just tracking how much you're doing these things versus things that are drawing you away from that stuff. The more you can account for effort toward these things, you're going to feel more satisfied with yourself. You're going to feel more productive. You're going to, well, you, you're probably the authority on it right now because you say things are different. You say you feel calmer. Where does that come from? In the protocol, why do you think you feel calmer? So what I have found, and you mentioned this, is the accountability and the, the way you make the suggestion is, um, to write down, come up with the 10 top things to do each day. What things? Let's clear. So, clear so the things that you have control over. Thank you. Yes. So not that, you know, gosh, I wish my husband was more emotionally available, but these are the things I can do for myself. And then what I've been doing is, um, and I followed your advice, which was don't just jot down 10 and be done. Like spend some time. I took a few days, like you said. Good. I started out with 15. I winnowed it down to 10. Uh-huh. And then I kept track each day just for five days yeah. of how many of those things I did. Um, added up, divided by five, and we want to get to a seven. Yeah. And so it, the part I think that's most effective, and I was already doing this, but in my journaling, uh keeping track and what happens is it's like a positive spiral where it's like oh yes i did have a better day because i held myself accountable to do those things even though after work if i was tired and i didn't want to do one of them i still did it is this one of your 10 items being accountable it isn't but kind of give give us an example okay so my items were and some of them i was already doing okay Um, so i have a morning meditation practice okay to do that um, and to follow that with a form of exercise, which mm-hmm. is either yoga or Pilates or whatever, mm-hmm. um, not to look at my email till I do those things on. to then, um, hit a benchmark in my work each day. Yeah. Um, after work to walk my dogs, cause usually I'm tired and hungry and don't want to but I made myself do it because for me, it helps me segue in from work Mm. and thinking about clients' problems to letting that go. Yeah. To make dinner instead of using DoorDash or Postmates, like (laughs) make dinner. Okay, let's take one of these. So anyway, I have a whole list. What did you do? Let's say make dinner. So what do you do with the protocol? What about making dinner? You see... 
What's the rating? How did you? So each one of those things gets a score of one if I did it. If you did it. If I did it. So if, and there were several more, I think I knocked off six or eight. But anyway, if I do all those things, I add it up. Mm -hmm. And we're looking for an average score of seven. Mm -hmm. And I don't always do all the things. So you don't have to be perfect and do all 10 every single day. Some days I can't do all those things because I have to show up in court or record a podcast. You're not shooting for 10. I can't make dinner. Seven is going to be good. Going out to dinner. Okay. But but the recording of it kept me on track yeah. and kept me true to myself. Mm. And it did increase my satisfaction. I can see how it's working. Mm-hmm. So, and, and your point is, is well taken, which is you don't beat yourself. I don't expect to do all 10 every day. Like yeah. if I, there was a day where I did all 10, I was like, that was kind of a perfect day, but mm. clients have emergencies and sometimes I can't do all the things, Uh but, but it's keeping me on track. It, it holds balance in my life. Perfect. I I think that's the number one thing Mm -hmm. is it keeps me more balanced. So I'm not just working all day or, or just, I don't know, ordering DoorDash every night, right? Mm -hmm. Like it, it provides more balance in my life. And I think like we talked about prior to this, if you know, you have a narcissistic partner it really helps you take the focus off them Mm. and puts it back on taking care of yourself yeah so where can we find your book because i think the protocol is really helpful thank you you can go to amazon you can get the ebook you can get the audio book and it's i think everybody has access to amazon now we do yeah Kevin, it's been so great talking with you today. Thank you. It's I been really, fun. really like the way you've taken some of these concepts that are simple but difficult in application mm-hmm. and turn them into, you know, a tool set. You've given us some tools so we can incrementally make changes and support our own well-being and in doing that be better partners, better friends and family met- members and better co-workers for each other. Absolutely. I love what I do. And it's that, just your countenance to hear that you're implementing the protocol and the interaction dial and the communication form, all this stuff, I see the benefits. And I, having changed careers midlife, now I go home at night knowing I made a difference in someone's life. Oh, that's what it's all about. There's nothing more rewarding. That's true. Yeah. Thanks. 